Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Beyond Indigo's Facebook Live series. Um, my name is Kelly Baltzell, and I'm the CEO and owner of Beyond Indigo Pets. Welcome. Um, today is Tuesday, which means it's a view from the hospital, and we are going to be focusing on the Midwest with Dr. Scott Burnett. He is from Animal um, Family and Forever Family. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. Yes. Great to be here, Kelly. Thanks. Um, Scott and I have known each other for years and have loved just intellectual discussions about how hospitals run and best practices. And Scott's going to share some of that for us today. Um, I always love the way you just think, Scott. I mean, you just kind of think out of the box, which is always just fun to see what you come up with. Um, so let's start sharing. Uh, past. So we're going to look at past, present, and future today is kind of our model because we're in an interesting time in the COVID era. So we kind of have the crisis and then we kind of have adaptation and now everybody's kind of going, now what? But catch us up, Scott. From the moment kind of like COVID hit the mid west area-ish, um, and maybe you can explain where you are to when you start geographically because um, you, you're kind of in different states. Um, what has happened to you till now? How's your business been? What are you seeing? Can you give us a little bit of an overview? Sure. Well, and, and I'll explain where I was when COVID really hit. Oh, that's true. So, <laughs> geographically, we have uh, two clinics. Uh, one in Iowa, one in Illinois. They're about 25 minutes apart and uh, and um, different sizes too. One's been uh, in business for almost 30 years versus the other one has only been in business for two years. So uh, certainly different size staff and different size client base. So because they're in different states and they're different sizes, we're able to really get a good idea of how the, the current crisis affects clinics um, in a different state and of different sizes. And because there's certainly different approaches we'll take at, at um, both clinics based on those things. And when this all hit really in early mid-March, um, we we're actually in spring break in uh, Mexico. So it was um, interesting. We Things hadn't really started to bear down yet when we left, but it really hit that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And um, we, we were, um, we, we got back in about a day before they closed the borders. So I was um, uh, preparing some of our initial responses with my practice manager from, uh, from Mexico, actually, as we sent out the initial notifications to our uh, clients and our staff. So that was an interesting place to be and it was good to be back home after that. Um, and, and really, I'd say um, it, it's, I wish I would have kept a journal a month ago of what I was thinking each day, okay. because I think my perspective as a, as a business owner has changed dramatically just in 30 days and really changes every day. Um, there was a, a, a lot of um, uh, questions that, that I had 30 days ago, but I think uh, even though we still have a lot of questions, I think as each day goes by, the um, the future really becomes, a, in my opinion anyway, a little bit more solid because I'm, I'm starting to realize more and more that we have, um, if we look around for opportunities, there are opportunities everywhere to uh, bounce up from this. And positive psychology, they, they refer to it as post-traumatic growth or falling up. So when we face adversity like this, if we continue to look for opportunities around us, we'll actually come out on the other side of it stronger than we were before. And the only way we became that strong on the other side is because of the ad adversity we faced. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would have never had this kind of growth. So that's kind of the perspective we've taken from it. I love it. And it's right. I mean, studies have been done in the past about the Great Depression right, and the Great Recession, and businesses that have bounced back and have been stronger have had the attitude like you've had. You know, we're saying lean into it, don't lean out of it, right, just embrace it. And you were saying you've been seeing some growth, like, in your practices, is that correct? Yeah, so the, um, at least in one practice, so, and this is where I think um, practice size matter matters a lot. Um, I was on a this would have been two weeks ago, but um, I was on a call uh, with a 
our, our webinar, and they were giving national statistics of uh, growth or, or, or um, retraction of clinics. And there was a pretty significant difference between uh, larger clinics versus uh, smaller clinics. Larger clinics tended, at least at that time, we're seeing about a 20% decline in business. Now, again, this was uh, three weeks ago. Right. And, uh, and I think that that trend is what we saw in our own clinics too. And I asked the host of the webinar why they thought that was, that it, it seemed like it affected larger practices a lot more than smaller practices. And they didn't really know. They hadn't analyzed the, the data enough to figure that out yet. My own guess based on our own two practices is with the larger practices, you have so many more employees um, that you really have to, uh, again, the, the lens I was looking at it from 30, uh, 30, four to six weeks ago was that how do we, um, how do we protect our employees first? Mm -hmm. And to do so in the larger practice, what made sense was to go to two teams of employees, uh, thinking that in case somebody did um, test positive in one team, it would only affect uh, potentially there'd be exposure to just half the employees. And we had the luxury of being able to do that because of the number of employees at the larger practice. However, by doing so, we also had to restrict our hours at that time and mm -hmm. make some changes to um, uh, really to workflow. And that's really going to potentially inhibit growth by doing that. Not, not that it's a wrong or the right decision. It's just uh, the decision we made at the time versus in a smaller practice, you don't have those luxuries of separating into two teams. You, um, you're kind of forced to, um, uh, from, a, from a scheduling, employee scheduling standpoint, um, really kind of uh, business as usual, do as best as you can. And what we found by doing that um, and going to curbside protocols with our clients um, is that not only is, is we were able to continue to experience growth in, in doing so. So um, uh, it, it, I kind of refer to it as in some ex, to some extent if is it's almost self-inflicted if we have uh, negative growth right now. Um, in, in some cases, because of changes we had to make to staff scheduling and things like that. And um, if you didn't make those changes, chance, there's a chance you could be growing right now. True. And speaking of changes right now, you, you're looking at changes right now in the present. I mean, you and I have had a few conversations about that where you're looking at protocols, you're looking at what's working and not working. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so one of the um, one of the things that uh, again looking for opportunities and um, is that especially thirty days ago, I, I felt like we would have some extra time to work on things that we always wanted to work on but never seemed to have time. And what we've found as a clinic is that many of the whenever we're uh, doing an issue discussion, it always almost comes back to uh, protocols and or training. So we decided to take this opportunity right now to document our most important protocols and processes and train on them. So what we're showing right now is an example of our, our uh, curbside exam process. And what we wanted to do is document every step in that and the sub steps in it and who was responsible for each step. Therefore, when uh, we can train on that and make sure that everybody sees what I'm saying when we're talking about how to do a protocol. Because if any one person within these steps does not um, do what they're responsible for, it really screws up the workflow of the whole protocol. So I think it's important to have, you have it documented. And I think it's just as important to, to train on it. Um, the, the titles on the side, CCA stands for Client Care Advisor and PCA stands for Patient Care Advisor. Got it. And you're just starting to roll these out, right? Yeah. So we're um, rolling these out for the um, uh, A, curbside protocol, wellness exam, sick patient exam, our grooming, our boarding processes. Uh, really, the, the main process is where we have client and patient interaction. So we, we as a staff can get all on the same page of how we're doing things and create the same experience for the client and patient each time we see them. Okay. And 
what do you think moving now into the future, let's say the future being the next month, right? Because you said 30 days ago seems like lifetimes ago. Because mm -hmm. it was. Like you had a different mindset 30 days ago than you do today. And like, you know, last week seems like 10 years ago. So time is a little little weird right now as we're fluid and we're adjusting. So in your best guess with your practice, looking 30 days ahead, say mid-June, what do you think you guys will be keeping, not keeping, um, still doing? Where are your thoughts on that? One of the reasons we're using curbside protocol as an example is I, I, I personally think that's going to be around for a while. I think our clients like it. It really keeps, uh, can, can, uh, uh, keep them safe and, and keep our employees safe. So as long as we need, as long as we can implement that in a, an efficient manner that cares for our clients, our patients and our staff, we're going to continue that for the foreseeable future. So I don't see that going away anytime soon. And what I really want to uh, shout out to a lot of clinics out there is that that the, I don't any business decline that they may have right now um, really can easily be um, uh, brought back, in my opinion. These are because it's uh, and I think that's going to happen. I think that as people get more used to the new normal. They're gonna um, they're gonna be seeking to to do things like that to go to the vet to uh, care for their pet even more and I think we as vet clinics have to be prepared for that when um, uh, for those opportunities so it's not like those clients or patients have gone away and I think we have to be prepared to care for them when things start to turn around. I agree, and then also all these new pet owners too. You know, there's been some discussion on well, okay. Are people going back to work? Are they going back to work in a physical building? Because now corporations are learning maybe they don't have to bring people back to a physical location. What happens to Fido, right? Yeah, So absolutely. Okay, so curbside is staying. Things are changing. You're adjusting your protocols, training your staff so you have some consistency. Um, and you guys are keeping busy, correct? Yeah, we are. We're as, um, as busy as we, we can be right now. So we're actually hiring employees. Um, again, prepared for, to prepare for, uh, it's not that we, at least at, um, are seeing tremendous growth at the, at the, the larger clinic. However, I'm, I'm confident and optimistic that that will be there um, in the near future, and we want to be prepared for it when it happens. So we're actually hiring employees because now is the time to train too. True. And, um, so we want to be prepared for that rebound when it comes and not, not if it comes, when it comes. And we want to be prepared and um, have everybody trained and ready to go. So we're, we're taking advantage of the time we have to do that right now. That's awesome. Well, any last words of advice to other veterinarians and hospitals out there? Um, well, before I get there, I do want to give a shout out to David Bennett from Vet Practice Consulting. Also, um, if you could just show, um, I meant to do that after the protocol because he actually was a consultant to help us write that protocol. And he's actually working with our leaders within our, um, our clinic to, uh, so he would work with our grooming leader or boarding leader then to write their particular protocol and document it. So they're all documented in the same fashion. So I want to thank David for all his help uh, with that. As far as advice for um, other practice owners out there or in, anybody at vet clinics, I, I really challenge you to look for um, the opportunities that are out there right now. And, and it's easy to, uh, one of the sayings we have is issues are opportunities. So it's easy to see opportunities if you just look at your issue list. And rather than look at them as issues, look at them as opportunities. And um, that's one of the first things we did is uh, go through our issue list and look at the opportunities we had out of it and uh, develop solutions based on those opportunities. I love it. Very concrete, objectable, manageable. You can see it in a list. You can check it off when it's done. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here, Scott, today. We really appreciate your insights. Thank you, Kelly.